分啦。各位好嘛，祝各位健康健康快乐。Et comme un bon nageur qui se bat dans l'eau, tu sillonnes le game en immense. สวัสดีค่ะสหายนายธรณีพลพวกเราในธรณีนี้ขอส่งมิตรจากการมีบัตรเห็น Hello from the children of planet Earth. With pictures from space. And voices from Earth. This is Neptune all night. Welcome. We're joining now in progress NASA's coverage of the Voyager 2 flight past the planet Neptune, live from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and from WHYY in Philadelphia. This is Neptune all night. The first 20 minutes of each hour will come to you from NASA in California. The rest of each hour through the night will feature. Astronomers, space travel experts, writers, and wits, with phone calls from you from across the country. Mm -hmm. Delivery is where we're going to deliver the planet. I mean, where we're going to deliver the spacecraft. And we don't—we're not trying to do that real accurately because, with this knowledge update, which we just finished doing yesterday, we can update this movable block and adjust for when we actually get there. The other, of course, that's, so far we've just talked about finding out where Neptune is. The other thing we have to know is part of the program, mm -hmm. obviously, is where's Triton, mm -hmm. and uh, I presume that there's Triton doesn't have the same gravitational pull on the spacecraft that Neptune does, so it's a different kind of problem to find out where Triton is. How do yes. you do that? Yes, yes, it actually turns out that that's easier oh. because Triton is a nice small object. Mm -hmm. Now, when you try to find where Neptune is, the first thing you've got that big image of Neptune up on the wall. Where's the center of it? Uh -huh. And you can't find the center of it very well, so it's much better for us to find out where Triton is. And since we know Triton goes around the center of Neptune, then we can find the, where Neptune is by finding out where Triton is. So you find the, 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 the center of the more or less circle made by Triton, and that's exactly, the yeah. exactly, yeah. And that's why all our op nav frames, optical navigation frames, are taken of Triton and a star. Mm -hmm. Very few of Neptune and a star, and those just very early on. But now you see the thing you pointed out is made more complex. You've noticed that uh, we've had today observations of the new object N2. We've had many observations of the ring arcs, and we're going to have an observation of N1. Mm -hmm. These are all new objects, yeah. so we have to predict where they are. We can't take an observation without predicting where they are. And our problem there is just the multiplicity: how many of them there are. Now that we have new moons and one and two and three and four and five and n six, there are possible orbits for all of those. Now, of course, one problem we don't have is the differential motions of the atmosphere. We don't have uh, dark spots moving to different latitudes and then going at different rotation rates. That's true. The the uh, rings and the ring arcs. Is it pretty much fortuitous that? The star in Sagittarius that that were panning through the ring arc happened to hit a ring arc, or yes, or, or did we have a, did we have a last minute chance to to change that observation? No, now? we have no chance. It's fixed. It was already set. We we take what we get. But have you noticed with the succeeding science results meetings how that arc has gotten extended further yes. and further? Yeah, as yes, more data comes in. So you suspect that the question is not will you intersect some arc, but rather will the part of the Ring that you intersect be dense enough to give you a return? Will enough of the starlight wink out behind it? And will it be part of that uh, rather large accumulation that will tell us something about what in the world is this stuff? Yes, it seems to be accumulated. And someday, perhaps, we'll try to figure out why. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a space computer rendering of, of uh, looking back to Earth as a Voyager data begins its uh, four-hour and six-minute journey. To the teams here at JPL, let's take a look at that. Is this what we're seeing now? That's what it is to look back at Earth. Well, all right, somewhere back there is Earth. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, it seems whatever has happened, it seems to have worked. Uh, I, of course, it'll be four hours before we know that the Voyager made it successfully past <laughs> the magical point. It, it's kind of interesting. It's, from the point of view of the photons that are bringing that message back, of course, it takes no time at all. <laughs> but uh, from our point of view, we got to wait. If you were photons. riding aboard a photon, you'd make it back here in no time. But from our point of view here, since the power of those photons is less than the light bulb in your refrigerator, of course, right. there are not too many of them. Not, not too many. At least not too many that we intercept. There are very few we intercept here. Well, um, what happens next? Uh, Voyager now is going past Neptune. It'll have a gravitational pull, of course, as it goes past Triton. Uh, where does it go? It goes off into interstellar space. Is it going to go any place interesting in interstellar space or just psh? Actually, it goes quite close to the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. Ah. But the reason that it does that is not because the Voyager spacecraft is so agile and moves so quickly, but rather because the star Sirius is moving toward us. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, and but so when I say close, I mean within one light year. So that's not exactly uh -huh. a close flyby, but... Uh, that's where it goes. <laughs> We're now four light hours away, and that's one going to be one light year away from Sirius. But I, we it, still have <coughs> an important navigation job to do. Well, what? What? When it goes so close to Neptune, Neptune's gravity is very sensitive in the direction it pulls us mm -hmm. to where we arrive. In other words, if we miss our Neptune aim point by, say, one kilometer, then we'll miss the occultation zone at Triton by six kilometers. So okay. we're very sensitive to just where we fly by. And that's another part of the tale. There are certain observations that are taken after we fly by, looking back, mm -hmm. that are very sensitive to precise pointing. There's a heat balance of the disk of Neptune, where they, they look with an infrared instrument and try to have Neptune just fill the field of view. Mm -hmm. So any variation in where you are is going to degrade that observation. It won't work as well. And so we need a precise pointing for that. There's another one um, that's looking for hydrogen uh, in Triton's orbit that also requires a precise pointing. And so we have a special procedure on the first post-encounter load that's just as tight time-wise as the one we just did for the encounter load. We have to take just a few pieces of data after the flyby in order to update our knowledge of where we're going after we go by Neptune in order to get the best results out of that load. And will this well. post-encounter load go up before the Triton? No, no. It goes up about four days after, four days after. the closest approach. Okay. But you see, the odd thing is that the best navigation data do not come at closest approach. This is one of the unusual things about navigation. Our best data occur when we can step back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the difficulty in finding the center if the object is too big. Yeah. So we don't want to be real close to the object when we take our data. And the same thing happens to be true of, of our uh, radio data as well. We don't want to be right on top of the object, because mm -hmm. then the, the data get confused by uh, some of the very fine points of its gravity. So we like to get our data going in, and then wait a couple of days and get more data coming out. So when the effect has been integrated over a long period of time, and the little details begin to average out, and you get the overall effect. That's it. That's it. Don, thank you very much for joining us. Al, I've appreciated the interview. And let's see, our next update will be at uh, 10 p.m. this evening. Uh, so this is Al Hibbs signing off now for Voyager Update.